mean, I thank uh, all of you for, because I know, because I have been in your position for like three years back, I have been an attendee for various conferences, so no, I know, like, you know, attending a last talk in a conference, it's, yeah, I mean, most people don't do that, but yeah, thanks for coming for my talk, and uh, uh, today we're going to speak about uh, something like most people uh, speak, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, if you have attended uh, some technical conferences and uh, stuff like that, so you may have seen the most uh, emerging topic after the blockchain and stuff like that, it is smart technology or uh, smart home or IoT. So there are very few people who speak about the security of it devices uh, because, you know, uh, the technology itself is a uh, double-edged sw uh, sword kind of a thing. So you could use it for uh, uh, for the uh, uh, creating a smart stuff for the people and also you could destroy the entire lives of the people with it. So the issue is that, you know, when at this point of time for the past three years, uh, there's an exponential increase in terms of uh, IoT stuff happening around the world and also uh, the smart home automations uh, coming into the market and the uh, availability of them and uh, more a uh, number of vendors and play players entering into the market made it much more competitive market for the end users as a buyer. But the issue is that when we buy a product, we don't see that, you know, uh, we, we, we only see how can we use it to make it as a smarter way for our life. But the other side of the story, like most people say, you know, it is much uh, darker than what we believe. Uh, there have been instances, you know, and uh, various reports that has been generated where, you know, some uh, people has been spying into your personal lives and stuff like that. So they are absolutely true. And uh, uh, in some of the company uh, cyber attacks, you know, uh, smart home was one of the initial point, you know, there was this uh, Las Vegas casino. It was hacked uh, via a fish tank IP camera. They were able to get into that and they were able to travel to the entire network of their corporate network and they were able to like, uh, take the entire money out of the casino within uh, one or two days. Uh, so the issues are many. The the attack vectors when you use a smart home, uh, they are very huge because uh, five years ago, if you want to uh, cyber attack a particular person or a company, uh, there were a lot of different uh, strategies that they used to go there. But when you have uh, internet of things and smart homes, it becomes much more easier and it, I mean, any people uh, can do that kind of stuff nowadays. Uh, so my talk is about like how to secure a smart home so that, you know, since uh, digital lives are already watched by many people, uh, so we don't want our personal lives to be like live streamed somewhere because uh, there was a recent scandal in, uh, in uh, South Korea probably, where, you know, the hotel guests have been live streamed, all their personal, uh, I mean, uh, things have been live streamed uh, into other people uh, when they have paid some enough money for it. So, uh, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kalyan Dixit. I come from a uh, country called India. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Hyderabad, India. So, uh, we do have a lot of... Uh, technical uh, stuff going on at our place. And we do have a lot of uh, PyCon conferences and PyCon uh, monthly meetups. And uh, I'm a Mozilla tech speaker. Uh, so as a Mozilla tech speaker, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege. Uh, Mozilla supports your uh, technical opportunities in a way. I mean, uh, people who speak about Mozilla Firefox or open web, um, Mozilla uh, kinds of uh, uh, sense an invitation saying that you know we would like to support you and you know make sure uh, you get that exposure around the world because you know as a uh, attendee and when you start speaking around you know it becomes difficult for you to speak around other conferences where you need to travel and uh, most of the time you know you need uh, financial assistance or stuff, uh, stuff like that uh, so Mozilla takes care of that and uh, we, we we do have a uh, eight weeks of training program and uh, Right now, uh, last week itself, I have uh, uh, like uh, trained around uh, seven people for this uh, our uh, third cohort, and there'll be other uh, cohorts c coming up. So, if you would like to join or if you would like to get to know more about it, I'll be around till the conference also, so we could have a chat about it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, th this was a. Uh, one of my uh, friends used to uh, speak about like, you know, uh, you don't want to be the star of others, uh, someone else's 
reality show uh, because you know when you are u- using smart home you are trying to know exactly what's happening uh, in your home when you are absent or when you are traveling or uh, what is exactly like you know to have a control on your home, home. Uh, but the issue is that not only you there'll be other people who knows everything about your home and uh, about you so basically your uh, privacy is a uh, compromised and uh, the issue is that uh so uh, in this talk uh, we going to speak about uh, smart homes security privacy and uh, tor and how to use tor to secure our smart homes uh so uh, the the most uh, basic question that most people ask uh, like are smart homes uh, secure like more than 90% of the smart homes they are not uh, secured in the world you know if you can uh, you can just use a single word to search in a uh, i think uh, there is a browser call showed on a uh, search engine which you know most hackers or uh, security researchers used to find out uh, internet of connected uh, devices online so you could just uh, search for them and you you have millions of devices online where you can access others people a uh, home and uh, control their thermostats or uh, uh, like uh, uh, even their uh, kettles uh, stuff like that and uh, yeah i mean uh, these are uh, some of the facts regarding the smart home uh, security in the last 2 uh, to 3 years the landscape has been uh, increasing exponentially and you know there is a statistics which which says that in the in the year of 2030 we do have uh, uh, like a 10x uh, number of devices connected uh, more than the population we may have around like uh, 70 to 80 billions of devices by the time in the year of 2030 which will be talking to each other but the only issue is that you know uh, the security is something which most people undermine it at this point but you know people have been trying to make sure uh, they they are trying to incorporate it and uh, and also trying to uh, ma- uh, make sure it is quite uh, easier for end users uh, to uh, use this devices in the future so uh, i mean uh, these are the few examples which i have taken yesterday from uh, shodan itself so you could access anyone's house uh, and you could control everything like you know even uh, you can even have their own uh, uh, like you know you could choose a room and you could uh, on and off the lights and you could control uh, and you could even uh, shut down their home or smart home systems and uh, and uh, create uh, havocs uh, so that you know they may not know exactly what's happening there but so uh, what is the issues that you know most people uh, are in smart homes uh, uh, things is that you know they, i mean uh, when you buy a smart home uh, there is no uh, lack of support for the next one year or two years and there is no proper updates uh, for the security issues you know which security researchers uh, uh, say to the vendors and you know there is no proper on time patching system at this point and also uh, when when a smart home product is introduced into the market it gets disconnect uh, discontinued within one or two years and there is no long time support for the people who bought it and you know this opens a lot of uh, privacy and security issues when you are using a outdated and a absolute model of a smart home and the other thing is that you know ma- uh the most miscom- uh, misconception people do have is like security uh, is privacy no security is not privacy security is different and privacy is entirely different so when you speak about security and privacy most end users or people think that they are like same uh, they are equal no uh, they are not equal security is a uh, different uh, uh, measure of things and uh, privacy is entirely based on your uh, uh, willingness to share uh, so uh, so the definition of uh, uh, security from wikipedia is like you know the state of being free from danger or threat and privacy like the state of uh, being where you are not observed for the things th- that you do for example if you take a uh, privacy is not you know privacy is something which you are uh, refusing to give your password uh, of your facebook that is your privacy security is like you know uh, you are uh, you are refusing to give your uh, debit card p- pin number you know there's a lot of difference between this k- kind of stuff uh, since both of them have uh, your own uh, secrets in them 
So uh, when uh, coming to Tor, I, I mean, uh, uh, most people may know Tor as a Tor browser. Uh, they may use it for their uh, uh, research or uh, technical purposes. But how does Tor exactly work? Uh, you know, I mean, how does Tor able to implement that? Uh, able to achieve that uh, anonymity level uh, only by Tor uh, is because you know when you start a Tor uh, browser, there is something called as relay system that happens behind the Tor browser, where you know uh, your uh, uh, your uh, your uh, data is been transmitted to different type of relays. Uh, so the difference between the proxy and the relay is that the proxy knows your uh, where, where where you are coming from, your IP address, your MAC address, and your uh, uh, website you're trying to uh, uh, trying to open up. But in a relay, uh, the relay doesn't know exactly anything about it. So it is entirely encrypted. So it it acts as a forward method of it. So if a, if there is an ABC of relay, so if you are trying to start from a relay, the the A relay only transmits a particular encrypted packet to the B relay. The B relay goes to the C, and uh, there's an exit node. Uh, so for example, if people are trying to uh, are trying to follow you or uh, stalk you digitally, the exit node is only exposed. Uh, to the uh, people who are tra trying to uh, uh, spy you, but the uh, the only issue is that the exit node also doesn't know the other relays IP addresses. So the only thing that you could see itself is the exit node. For example, if you are uh, trying to access uh, internet from uh, uh, Europe, uh, so your exit node can be somewhere in uh, Australia or. New Zealand. So the only the IP address of the New Zealand and Australia is logged into the system itself. So uh, for uh, the problem to solve the smart home issue is that you know we do have a couple of open source home automation systems you know, which do get updated re regularly and you know they are audited also for the security and uh, maintenance issues and uh, they are, uh, we do have around like five uh, open source systems at, at this point. The Calaos, Open Hub, Open Hub, and uh, Open Motix and Home Assistant and Things Gateway. So I do work on the Things Gateway uh, project because you know we do have something called as Project uh, Things from Mozilla. Uh, so Things Gateway is is part of the project. So in Things Gateway, what we have done is that you know uh, we didn't go to uh, trying to invent the wheel again, right? You know because most of the time, uh, if you are uh, introducing a new product or in uh, or a new hardware uh, thing into the market uh, so as a d developer or a, as a uh, enthusiast or uh, who want to interact with the device you know you, you have to go through a uh, lots of documentation and all, uh, lots of trial and error issues most of the time but you know we have taken the existing web protocols and we have created a uh, easier way for the end user to connect the things gateway uh, to other devices the other uh, interesting thing is that you know if you buy a smart home and uh, uh, if it is on a different protocol and uh, other uh, smart home is uh, other uh, protocols on a different uh, protocol you know at this point of time uh, th there is no uh, per vendor integration between these devices to talk and to transmit the data between them but using a things gateway you do have a single uh, control dashboard where you could control your devices and also make sure uh, you do have a logical flow of them and you could also have small uh, uh, rules easily which are uh, based on if then then this logic for example if there is a uh, if the uh, room heats more than 15 degrees centigrade on the AC it, it is as simple as that uh, so this is the architect of it so we have uh, made sure that you know as a de developer coming from a basic uh, web development background it is easier for him to write code or uh, uh, add its own adapters or plugins for it so it is entirely based on HTML CSS and JavaScript and in the b b backend uh, node JS has been used for the backend database and uh, we do have something called as adapters where you could uh, interact with the devices I uh, mean by writing uh, five to six lines of code and uh, and uh, though at this point we do support around four to five languages we do support uh, the uh, rust go c++ c and uh, the javascript and other languages so uh, when you uh, create 
the things gateway when you log in for the first time you do also have an advantage uh, which other smart home devices uh, at this point don't have is that you know you can create your own subdomain on uh, mozilla hyphen iotd.org where, where you get a free https certificate from the let's encrypt uh, authority and the most important uh, easiest thing is that uh, you can control your smart home anywhere in the world so you need not open the your uh, uh, ports in your router or use a dynamic uh, dns to set it so that you know you can access remotely you do have your own uh, web domain where you can attach it to your uh, uh, created and uh, you use the Raspberry Pi and uh, the Raspberry Pi stays at your home and when you travel around, you could access your website, log into it and you could control your home. Uh, basically, the we, we use a PageKite uh, service which takes care of everything at this point and also we do have a third party uh, authentications like, you know, you could uh, attach your uh, Mastodon servers for it and we, we, we use the OAuth uh, protocol uh, for the third party integrations. And uh, coming to the part where uh, we are going to use Tor as a uh, to extend more uh, security is that, you know, there is something called as hidden services by Tor where you could uh, create your own Onion service and host it in your uh, local instance. And uh, only the people who have the Onion service and the authentication cookie can log into your home uh, smart home system. So it is a three-step process. Basically, you just need a Raspberry Pi and a... Uh, and your own interest of open uh, open source home auto automation instance, and you need to install it and uh, Tor uh, software. Then you need to uh, create a host name and a private key, and then uh, you just need to add uh, three or four lines of code in the Tor configuration file. So the step one includes the uh, three lines of code that you need to add uh, the service directory code where you do where the tor has the read and write permissions uh, to write the changes in it and the other one is the source port like you know where do you want to host it on the onion service it can be of any port number like 80 or uh, 1428 and also the uh, instance and the IP address, the port number and the IP address of your uh, software that you are running in it and also the uh, authorized client. So uh, this authorized clients make sure that you know uh, the connection between your uh, the Onion service and uh, accessibility uh, so the other relays may, may not know a, anything about your Tor relay and it is completely encrypted and also the stealth value uh, makes sure that the traffic between the home instance over Tor is completely secured from other relay nodes uh, getting to know exactly what it is. So uh, and last year we uh, Tor has upgraded the Onion domains into the new v3 versions uh, so uh, primarily we used to have like uh, 16 bit uh, 16 uh, 15 or 16 uh, characters length of onion address but in v3 uh, version we do have 56 uh, length of onion addresses and also the back end uh, uh, encryption authentication has been uh, moved out from uh, in the v2 onion so we, we used to use uh, sha1 and rsa 1024 but uh, we use uh, uh, SHA-3, then we have moved to uh, CUV-22519 and other uh, uh, most uh, secured authentication encryptions at, at this point. And uh, the, if you want to host it on the V3, you just need to add a line called hidden service version 3 and you get your own uh, new V3 version of Onion address and uh, yeah, you just need to restart the of service and you need to know the onion address that has been created and the authentication cookie which you required uh, i mean you can create n number of authentication cookies for the particular onion address and and also you could know exactly like you know when you give out a authentication cookie to someone of your family member uh, so you know which person have an authentication cookie and you know at any point of time you can revoke the authentication cookie given to a particular onion domain So uh, this is the server side of the setup. So when you go for the client side access, you just need to add a one line of code, uh, which uh, which uh, consists of hidden service uh, authorization with the onion address and the 
authentication cookie. So when you log in for the first time, if you don't have the authentication cookie, then uh, the you cannot uh, log in to your home instance. But the authentication cookie makes sure that you know it uh, you're the authorized person to access your home inst uh, home instance with the part that particular uh, on your domain. And uh, I mean uh, the last line is the. Uh, directory path for uh, the configuration file for the client uh, uh, changes that need to be done or uh, on Windows or Mac or Linux systems. And yeah. thank you. I mean, if you have any doubts, you can ask me. And yes, they do. <laughs> so uh, let's start with the first one. Can you recommend any open source home automation software or toolkit? I mean, uh, I I would be partial in myself, and I would recommend the Mozilla Things Gateway. But I've also used the Open uh, Open App system, which is quite good. And uh, the other one I would recommend is the Home Assistant. You know, which is uh, uh, which have uh, released the new version uh, 0 0.9. which do have a uh, support. Uh, around like 350 devices, it does support uh, that many devices. So it is your uh, choice to use between these three uh, instances like software. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Chrome Explorer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I this mean, one uh, looks like so Thunderbird. I do have a Edge and a Chrome. And uh, the blue one is a Firefox. Uh, nightly version so it gets updated every ah. uh, every night the other one is the tor browser the other one is a brave uh, browser yeah okay that explains it <laughs> uh, can we use some python libraries to write an adapter or just use python yeah i mean you could also use uh, python to write adapters for the things gateway so let me just Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to write them. So you yeah, could use Python would. to write your things uh, adapter in it. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is my question. So uh, <laughs> you want to say, uh, I'll ask. Uh, so uh, usually ISPs are blocking all open ports from ordinary users outside to the internet. Shouldn't they be handling you know, this? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, ISPs should never be handling our own uh, data because at this point, you know, uh, we do have something called as net uh, neutrality at, at this point, right? So they may throttle your service or they may even block complete access to your uh, like home uh, smart home system, yeah. which uh, becomes a huge issue. Even though you use this uh, softwares, when you don't even have access to them, then what's the point of using them? Why do you, yeah, yeah. Why do you have internet? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just happening here now and then. But you can like override them and ask them, but by default. Yeah. So, uh, what is your typical work day like uh, as a technical writer speaker? Do you also code? So uh, I am a part-time speaker. I do work in my friend's company called Vilabs back in India. I am a security developer. So I I, I used to work as an ASP.NET developer for two years working with clients for the Azure deployments, then I have moved to the uh, security side of the products because the reason was that uh, some of the clients that uh, products that we have developed, you know, they have uh, been hit by the ransomware or the cyber attack. So we, uh, we uh, so I, I thought of why don't we also provide a security service for them, then uh, I have moved into security domain. So I do have a passion for security and I've been l l learning a lot from other people in the security and infosics uh, domain for the past uh, six to seven years. Uh, thanks. Um, so recently I read an article that Tor was basically uh, an US intelligence yeah. agency development yeah, and they are basically running it because they can then hide their agents all over the world. So aren't you, uh, don't you have concerns about then getting uh, uh, so the, uh, so, uh, when you run a Tor relay, uh, Tor doesn't have any access uh, 
to your smart home and they don't even know which uh, uh, onion uh, does your smart uh, smart home has uh, so there is something called as a directory services when you are trying to be a exit relay for example when you are uh, uh, trying to run a tor relay there are two types of tor relays most people uh, uh, you can be a in between relay or you could be a exit relay exit relay is nothing but the end ip address which gets logged into application the only issue is that when people do run exit relays uh, they do get uh, uh, isps uh, notice saying that so if if a person commits an illegal thing uh, to tor and if your ip address is, is an exit relay so you will be held uh, responsible in the first uh, case uh, if it is a uh, filed by anyone uh, so if you want to run a tor relay you could be the middle uh, the middle uh, relay and the uh, access to tor is uh, like a uh, tor doesn't have any access over any of the onion addresses or any of the relays it is completely encrypted uh, and also regarding the concerns of the us it has been like um, um, mentioned uh, re recently by uh, Roger, who is the co-founder of uh, Tor in the uh, Fosdom conference, which has happened in Berlin in February, that you know uh, the code is completely open source. You could just audit, and it it has been debunked several times. That you know initially the project was started by the US, but right now uh, most people and most uh, uh, security researchers uh, are on uh, tor and uh, it is completely safe and uh, secure until unless uh, uh, someone uh, comes up with an uh, zero day attack which is uh, not based on tor but it's uh, based on firefox esr because you know tor is uh, tor does run on firefox esr browser so yeah then yeah uh so uh, is there a mechanism in your proposed Tor scheme that would account for malicious bots popping up on Tor? The kind which the internet is full of, if yes, what it is? What is it? Um, uh, so uh, when you, uh, when, a, when a malicious relay which has a objective to, you know, uh, to spy on other relays has been uh, popped up in the Tor relay. The people in the Tor immediately they, they do have a mechanism where they could uh, shut down a relay completely, making sure that you know the other re relays are not getting affected and also not getting spied on. So it uh, it does happen automatically. And in, in terms of uh, bots, there is a kind of a mechanism they are trying to work out. But at this point, you know there is no. Uh, Definite to mechanism either on Tor or either on IRC at this point. Thanks. So, thank you a lot. Yeah, again. And, uh, thank you so much, guys. <laughs>